I'm uh, very excited to uh, um, give this talk to uh, such a broad audience of, uh, of, uh, speak uh, of uh, speakers and uh, um, people who have zoomed in to, uh, to this uh, symposium. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Chemical and Engineering News uh, for organizing this symposium, and I'm uh, very honored to have been selected as part of the class of 20. Uh, 21. Um, so uh, with that, uh, um, I wanted uh, um, to focus this uh, presentation on uh, um, and sharing some of the um, broader interests in my lab, uh, um, which uh, um, try to address where we try to address some different uh, questions in uh, immunology and neuroinflammation by the application of chemical proteomic approaches. Uh, but before I go into uh, uh, more science, I wanted to start by um, also describing my journey to the Rockefeller University. Um, so I was born and raised uh, in Moscow, Russia, where my parents did a fantastic job raising me and my, my sister uh, by taking us out to Dacha every summer uh, where we could go and uh, uh, grow uh, vegetables and mushroom, go mushroom picking, but uh, uh, by also focusing on uh, making sure that we learned English very early on, which is a very useful skill as I've uh, learned uh, uh, over the years, uh, as, as well as um, um, my mom played a big role uh, by being very proactive uh, with uh, seeking out opportunities for both me and my sister uh, in terms of uh, our education. And uh, uh, she was the reason why I attended uh, uh, a, a high school that was focusing on chemistry actually very early on and uh, um, started doing research uh, uh, very early on in glycoconjugate chemistry and polysaccharide analytics. Um, after high school, I went on to uh, do my uh, MS studies uh, in Higher Chemical College uh, of Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, but there were a number of people who have influenced uh, and shaped my scientific uh, uh, interests uh, during that time as I've uh, gone on a number of internships around the world, including uh, United States, uh, Switzerland, and, uh, uh, and France. Um, and I'm very grateful for all the mentors that I've uh, uh, met throughout the, these experiences, both uh, working on my master thesis with Yulia, uh, but also going to um, uh, to do uh, research internships uh, around the globe, uh, and as uh, if you pay more attention to 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 the the list of the names, you you will recognize a theme emerging. Um, I was very attracted to organometallic chemistry back uh, in the days, and. Uh, uh, it was not a surprise for my pa my uh, family when I decided to uh, go to MIT to pursue my PhD studies under um, or with uh, uh, Steve Buckwald um, uh, doing uh, research in organometallic chemistry and uh, um, mostly uh, working on applying organometallic uh, chemistry approaches to expand our synthetic uh, uh, um, toolbox, but also uh, in the very end of my PhD studies, applying organometallic chemistry to chemical biology and bioconjugation in collaboration with Brad Penteludi, Penteludi's lab. Um, following my PhD studies, I moved across the country to pursue my uh, postdoctoral work uh, with Ben Kravat, uh, uh, where we, uh, where uh, where I really uh, uh, took a deeper dive into. Uh, chemical biology and chemical proteomics, and uh, uh, worked uh, in collaboration with a number of very uh, talented people, but in particular John Tajaro, who uh, we collaborated on uh, our project on uh, studying T cells uh, and uh, our, um, applying chemical proteomic uh, uh, platforms to understand uh, T cell misregulation. Uh, so as Beth mentioned, uh, I'm currently a, um, an assistant professor and head of the Lab of Chemical Immunology and Proteomics at Rockefeller University, and our lab was uh, very recently established in December 2020. Um, uh, so our overarching uh, um, uh, goal in the lab is uh, expanding our understanding uh, of uh, misregulation of protein function and disease and coming up with uh, new methods uh, for targeting protein function in disease. Uh, and we try to do it in the, in the context of, uh, um, of uh, uh, trying to study uh, the state-dependent chemical immunology and neuroimmunology. Uh, and we do this through the development of new chemical tools, uh, uh, which will uh, help us uh, to, um, uh, to block uh, the protein function through uh, targeting active sites of proteins or protein degradation as well as through the advancement of uh, 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 proteomic platforms. And I'll tell you a little bit more throughout the, the talk about this. 
So why are we interested in uh, studying misregulated immune responses? I, I guess I, it won't be an understatement that the past two years have really highlighted the role of our immune system as a guardian against pathogens, um, as well as cancer. Uh, but when misregulated immune system plays a number of uh, deleterious roles, including uh, um, playing a, a causal uh, role for a number of different diseases, ranging from um, autoimmune diseases to neurodegeneration and cancer. Um, and it is greatly appreciated that uh, immune cells can undergo a number of phenotypic changes, which uh, uh, makes them big players in both human physiology and pathology. Uh, and uh, over the years, a number of uh, global scale genomic and transcriptomic approaches have uh, emerged to try to understand these uh, uh, changes on a more molecular level and uh, um, oftentimes uh, generating uh, unique signatures for misregulated uh, cell states in specific um, pathologic conditions, um, uh, which uh, led to identification of a number of uh, not just uh, um, um, uh, genes, uh, uh, misregulated genes, but also proteins that uh, uh, change in expression under different pathologic states. Um, however, it is very important to know that uh, uh, molecular events that lead to functional changes uh, often don't involve changes in gene or protein abundance, um, and therefore uh, methods for uh, gaining a better molecular level understanding uh, of these post-translational changes are, are, are very important. Um, so as I already mentioned, uh, uh, immune cells undergo a number of phenotypic changes. And a lot of times these phenotypic changes are associated with biochemical changes. And these have been studied um, extensively over the years. And a number of these changes don't really also uh, um, go in hand with the gene expression changes uh, and uh, require additional methods for uh, studying them. And uh, furthermore, um, how these biochemical changes correspond to molecular level changes, as I already uh, mentioned, is uh, poorly understood. And our lab wants to uh, develop uh, platforms to be able to uh, assess these molecular level changes to gain uh, new insights into biology, uh, but also to uh, identify new targets that can be, um, that can be uh, specifically targeted in a, a cell so basically, the question that we are asking in the lab and that I started asking when I was a postdoc in Ben Kravat's group is, can we use uh, these nucleophilic amino acid residues such as cysteine and lysine as sensors of these biochemical changes during immune cell misregulation or activation, for example? Uh, and uh, indeed, cysteine has been used as a handle for protein structure determination back in the 1960s, where Kendrew, uh, Kendrew and Perutz used um, organomercury uh, complexes to facilitate X-ray structure determination, for which they got, uh, further got the, their Nobel Prize for. Uh, furthermore, cysteine and lysine were used as, as handles to study protein dynamics also back in the, uh, in the late uh, uh, 10 to 20 years ago by a number of uh, uh, very uh, economic accomplished uh, scientists, uh, three of the Nobel uh, laureates are listed below, um, who have contributed to the studies of using cysteine and lysine as handles to study protein dynamics uh, through NMR um, uh, methodologies. However, these approaches, while very powerful to study uh, protein structures and protein dynamics, only focus on specific proteins uh, uh, in isolated settings. Uh, so what we are trying to ask and what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to apply these broad scale pr proteomic platforms to gain very similar structural and fu functional insights uh, into the biochemistry of prote proteins that is changing depending on the cell states. And there are a number of chemical proteomic platforms that have been developed uh, over, over the past um, uh, through the pioneering work of uh, Ben Kravat and Matt Boggio as well, and the more recent work uh, uh, coming out of their labs and other labs uh, uh, within the, the proteomic community. Um, but uh, these days we are able to um, ask these broad scale questions where we're looking into, uh, for example, drug ability on a proteome wide scale. So which sites can, uh, in, in, across the proteome, can accommodate ligands for 
drug development purposes, but also um, what we call reactivity profiling, um, where we are looking at the uh, differences in the innate reactivity of specific cysteine residues uh, in different cell states, and we're trying to um, to use them to uh, uh, as a potential opportunity to target pathological but non physiological states. And just a little bit in more detail, when we're uh, when we're using uh, the reactivity profiling platforms, we're looking at the reactivity of specific sites and proteins in cells in different states, and we're looking at the differential reactivity uh, with uh, the um, broadly reactive iota sediment probes or um, um, other uh, probes for lysine targeting. And we're hoping to use this as an unbiased tool for discovery of uh, biochemical changes in cells. And indeed, we were able to highlight this in the case of T-cell activation, where the uh, T-cells uh, showed uh, a number of proteins showed increased uh, reactivity of specific cysteines involved in redox regulation, likely reflecting on a higher reducing potential of activated T-cells. Um, and I just wanted to also show this example where we're finding sites that are changing in reactivity that are close to cofactor or metabolite binding sites. Uh, serving as kind of handles to uh, to read out the biochemical changes within the cells. Um, so, um, as I already mentioned, another approach that we're using is uh, this uh, uh, so-called drugability or ligandability profiling approach, which allows us through the use of so-called uh, small molecule scout fragments uh, to interrogate the, uh, the whole proteome on uh, the ability of specific residues to accommodate the uh, um, cysteine electrophiles uh, for future drug development purposes. And indeed, the uh, covalent electrophiles possess a number of uh, benefits uh, for drug development purposes. Uh, and uh, um, this approach allows us uh, to uh, read out uh, uh, thousands of sites in a single uh, proteomic experiment. And uh, we applied this approach to studying uh, T-cell activation and identified over 3,000 sites that can, in theory, be uh, targeted with small molecule covalent electrophiles, including sites on uh, the proteins which are typically to considered harder to drug proteins, such as adaptive proteins and transcription factors. Uh, and I'm also showing you one target uh, that uh, highlights uh, the uh, the importance of applying these methods to different cells in different cell states, uh, because uh, we also identified a number of uh, um, um, sites that can be targeted with small molecule covalent electrophiles in checkpoint receptors, which were only quantified in the activated T cells uh, versus the quiescent T cells. Uh, so what do we do uh, to advance these uh, um, uh, uh, ligands to uh, more elaborated probes? We uh, usually try to come up with uh, function-first approaches to uh, be able to screen more advanced libraries of compounds uh, um, uh, with uh, covalent electrophilic warheads. And one of the approaches is shown here where we use the um, assay for inhibitors of uh, T-cell activation and we um, I realized that the, this approach uh, allows us to identify um, ligands with unique pharmacology where three out of the four compounds that we uh, were following up on uh, showed their mechanism of action to involve uh, degradation of their respective targets from different protein classes. And uh, uh, most interestingly, the degradation of the proteins was actually uh, state dependent. And a very good example of it is this um, ITK degrader that I'll uh, briefly go into uh, um, this uh, this story. Um, so we are interested uh, uh, in this uh, series of uh, stereoisomeric probes uh, that uh, we uh, started uh, studying them in collaboration with uh, 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 Professor Schreiber's lab. Uh, and the reason why we are interested in it is because uh, uh, having sets of these stereoisomeric probes allows us to streamline uh, the um, mechanism of action studies as well as uh, target focus studies for understanding the, the roles of specific targets as uh, they uh, serve, uh, um, as they provide built in a structure activity relationship uh, within the library design. Um, so indeed, we found a set of four compounds where only one compound, uh, only one stereoisomer um, showed inhibition of T-cell activation. And looking at the targets of the compounds, we were able to identify a limited set of targets that were specific specific for uh, the active compound. But I wanted to just highlight that uh, um, we also believe that uh, being able to do chemical proteomic profiling on these stereoisomers also allows us to pick up uh, 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 compounds uh, that uh, specifically target um, uh, um, 
their protein targets uh, in a stereoselective manner, which allows us to uh, start uh, additional programs into looking into the function of those proteins and the inhibition of those sites. Uh, so going back to the uh, targets of the active compounds, we also identified ITK and other immune uh, 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 immune um, relevant kinase uh, to be another target of these compounds. But in this case, uh, we didn't see this, this site that, to be engaged of ITK because we don't see this peptide in our proteomic experiments. But we saw state-dependent degradation of ITK in our whole proteome and enriched proteomics experiments. And here I'm just showing you the stereoselective degradation of ITK. Uh, and what's uh, uh, very interesting to us is that uh, uh, the more studies we uh, we do and the more uh, compounds that we uncover to uh, be small molecule degraders of protein targets is uh, the more we understand that the ligand does matter for protein degradation. Um, so by comparing our compound to the known inhibitor of uh, cysteine 442 and ITK kinase, we're able to see that the, while uh, the known inhibitor actually stabilizes the inactive conformation of ITK, our inhibitor um, uh, leads to ITK degradation, um, although the known inhibitor does prevent the, um, our compound from uh, comp uh, from uh, um, uh, diesel activation induced uh, uh, degradation. Um, so. Uh, uh, Finding uh, uh, these examples from our T cell uh, focus study has really highlighted the, the fact that the small molecule covalent electrophiles can serve as uh, privileged scaffolds for protein degradation, and we are uh, focusing on um, building out uh, additional screens to identify uh, new scaffolds uh, uh, that can um, degrade the protein targets um, through molecular glue a degrader mechanism, but also through other mechanisms. And as are the labs, we're also uh, trying to expand this uh, this uh, um, uh, approach to um, uh, to building out the protax, which would uh, basically transform our ligands that we're discovering for specific targets into uh, into potential drug leads uh, with uh, with a functional output through protein degradation. With that, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, Ben for being an amazing mentor over the years and for assembling an, a, a fantastic group of people in his lab um, who have been uh, um, helpful throughout my time uh, in Ben's lab. And I also wanted to thank uh, uh, my my new group uh, at Rockefeller University who have uh, um, exciting uh, who have been excited about the projects in the lab and uh, uh, who uh, are very enthusiastic about the science that we do. I also wanted to thank uh, the funding agencies and also in particular Rockefeller University with, who, whose community has been very supportive uh, while I was starting during uh, the COVID times in 2020. And just to uh, give uh, uh, pictures to uh, uh, faces to names, I just wanted to uh, show our current uh, group members in the lab and just uh, give a small pitch that we do have uh, um, positions open for postdoctoral fellows with cell biology and molecular neuroscience experience right now in the lab. Uh, so feel free to apply to me directly. Uh, and with that, I just wanted to uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Katya. I'm going to ask one quick question from Dongsik Park, who asks, um, who points out there's a lot of thiols uh, in the cell, uh, and uh, asks basically, how do you uh, avoid other thiol-containing groups to get site specificity? So I think there are a number of uh, good examples for the development of uh, advanced uh, um, um, drugs that are specific for uh, for for their respective targets, including, you know, ibrutinib and calibrutinib. So it, it is a, a combination of affinity and reactivity for, for, the, for the cysteine sites. Um, and another good example is, you know, dimethylfumarate, which is an approved drug as well, um, which targets specific uh, um, cysteines in, uh, in proteins. Thanks so much.